Amid public outcry over the United States' involvement in the Vietnam War, Daniel Ellsberg, a former Pentagon staffer, created conflict with the U.S. government when he leaked the Pentagon Papers to the New York Times in 1971. These top-secret documents exposed the intentional deception of the American public by the Johnson administration. After refusing to cease publication of the Pentagon Papers, the New York Times was sued by the Nixon administration. In a 6-3 compromise, the Supreme Court ruled the government failed to provide evidence showing credible damage to national security, setting a precedent that cemented the press as a crucial check on executive power. In the wake of World War II, the United States feared the spread of communism to small, vulnerable countries in Asia, such as Vietnam. After years of conflict during the Indochina War, Vietnam was split in half along the 17th parallel by the Geneva Accords. Ho Chi Minh became president of Communist North Vietnam, while Ngo Dinh Diem took control of U.S.-backed South Vietnam. A deeply anti-communist ruler, Diem instituted an oppressive autocracy whose discriminatory practices created conflict with the Buddhist majority. The deep unpopularity of Diem's regime led to the formation of the National Liberation Front, or NLF, in 1960. The NLF was a communist nationalist group aiming to overthrow the South Vietnamese government and unite Vietnam under communism. In 1961, the NLF, now known as the Viet Cong, began carrying out increasingly destabilizing assassinations and bombings throughout South Vietnam. U.S. President John F. Kennedy responded to this domestic terrorism by sending military advisors to the South, hoping to limit the influence of communism in the region. While Diem's government attempted to quell this uprising through the use of military force, it ultimately failed to destroy the Viet Cong despite extensive aid from the U.S. Two years later, Lyndon B. Johnson inherited control of U.S. foreign policy after Kennedy's assassination. Unlike his predecessor, Johnson sought to increase the United States' involvement in Vietnam, believing military intervention was key to defeating communism. As the U.S. government began exploring additional avenues towards increased military presence in Vietnam, they enlisted the aid of several foreign policy advisors and strategists. In 1964, Daniel Ellsberg was hired by John McNaughton the Assistant Secretary to Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara. On August 4th, Ellsberg's first day on the job, North Vietnamese ships ostensibly attacked the USS Turner Joy in the Gulf of Tonkin. On August 7th, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution was passed, allowing Johnson to take all necessary measures to repel any armed attack against forces of the United States. Following this resolution, McNaughton instructed Ellsberg to compile a report detailing the most recent Viet Cong attacks on American assets, aiming to convince the president to escalate action in North Vietnam. That night, Ellsberg feverishly assembled a collection of the most gruesome Viet Cong attacks, including reports of two recently slaughtered U.S. advisors whose bodies were dragged through the streets and a village chief who was publicly disemboweled. Moved to action by Ellsberg's report, Johnson initiated widespread bombing throughout northern Vietnam in 1965, in direct contrast with his 1964 presidential campaign promise he sought no wider war. In addition to this bombing campaign, Johnson deployed over 150,000 U.S. troops, effectively engaging the United States in a war with Vietnam. This enraged many Americans who gathered across the country to culminate what they viewed as a futile and destructive war. On an assignment in South Vietnam in 1966, Ellsberg made the grim realization that despite increased troop levels and firepower, the United States was making little progress. Back in the U.S., Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara was also beginning to doubt the efficacy of a military solution in Vietnam. After returning home in 1967, Ellsberg was approached by Pentagon officials working for McNamara who were creating a top-secret study to examine U.S. involvement in Vietnam. Ellsberg agreed to contribute to this report, titled United States-Vietnam Relations 1947-1967. Although Ellsberg uncovered massive government deception while working on this report, it was never distributed as McNamara was fired before its conclusion in 1968. In the face of public outrage over the United States' continued involvement in Vietnam, Johnson declined to seek re-election. On January 20, 1969, Richard M. Nixon became the 37th President of the United States. While Nixon announced the withdrawal of 25,000 U.S. troops from Vietnam in June, he had no plans for a swift end to the war. Nixon viewed this move as a means to bargain with North Vietnam. They could not come to an agreement, Nixon was prepared to retaliate with even more military force than his predecessors. Meanwhile, armed with a confidential knowledge of government deception and the futility of prolonged military action, Daniel Ellsberg sought options to expedite the end of the Vietnam War. In 1969, Ellsberg attended the War Resisters International Conference in Philadelphia, 
where he participated in protests and listened to several activist speeches. He was particularly inspired by a young protester named Randy Keeler, who spoke about resisting the draft and was facing up to two years in jail. After the speech, Daniel Ellsberg found himself asking, what can I do to help end this war? On September 30th, 1969, Ellsberg called Anthony Russo, a former colleague from his time as a foreign policy advisor, to ask for help leaking the top secret report he had finished one year earlier. A staunch opponent of the war, Russo was eager to help Ellsberg copy the papers. For the next 20 months, Ellsberg and Russo created multiple copies of the report and began distributing them to anti-war members of Congress. After reviewing the document, each official refused to make the report public due to the sensitive nature of its contents. As a result, Ellsberg decided to contact New York Times reporter Neil Sheehan, hoping he would expose the deception revealed in the top secret study. Ellsberg knew he could be facing life in prison for revealing this information, but he was prepared to live out the rest of his life in a jail cell so the American public would know of the government's duplicity. On June 13, 1971, the New York Times published the first story about the classified report, which gained notoriety as the Pentagon Papers. Spanning three columns, the first story referencing the Pentagon Papers revealed former President Johnson had sought to escalate conflict in Vietnam, contradicting previous statements he made to the public. The Times' expose also revealed the U.S. government recognized the futility of continuing war in Vietnam, but feared the optics of losing a war to a poor, isolated communist nation. Anti-war activists were furious, viewing the Pentagon Papers as direct proof of government deception and callous disregard for the lives lost in Vietnam. After the release of the Pentagon Papers, the Nixon administration was enraged and deemed the leaks treasonous. Nixon issued an order to the Times calling on them to halt publication of the classified material or face federal charges. Despite this warning, the New York Times continued publication of the Pentagon Papers until a court order blocked them from doing so. Upon learning the Times could no longer report on the papers, Ellsberg decided to leak the documents again. On June 18th, five days after the first story on the Pentagon Papers was published, the Washington Post obtained their own copy of the dossier. However, before the Post could produce any articles concerning the Pentagon Papers, they were ordered to stop by the government. Wishing to further inform the public, Ellsberg leaked the paper to 17 additional news outlets before turning himself into the FBI on June 28th. Despite additional attempts to block the stories from publication, the Nixon administration ultimately could not keep up with the speed of the leaks. Meanwhile, the dispute between the government, the New York Times, and now the Washington Post reached the Supreme Court on appeal. The government argued the publication of the Pentagon Papers jeopardized national security by threatening the safety of troops abroad. In contrast, the Times asserted they had the right to publish the documents under the First Amendment, which states, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. On June 30, 1971, the Supreme Court ruled against the government upholding the rights of the press to continue publication in a 6-3 compromise. In the days that followed, both outlets resumed coverage of the Pentagon Papers, further exposing the deceptive policies of the Johnson administration. Continued outcry stemming from the coverage of the papers eventually led Nixon to withdraw troops from Vietnam in 1973. Good evening. I have asked for this radio and television time tonight for the purpose of announcing that we today have concluded an agreement to end the war and bring peace with honor in Vietnam. President Gerald Ford later withdrew the last remaining Americans from Vietnam in 1975 officially ending the United States' involvement in the Vietnam War. Less than one year later, Vietnam was united under communism after the North's swift defeat of the remaining South Vietnamese forces. Although Ellsberg and Russo were tried for copying and leaking the Pentagon Papers to the press, a mistrial was declared and charges against the duo were dropped after it was revealed government officials had broken into the office of Ellsberg's psychologist in an attempt to find discrediting information. The verdict reached by the Supreme Court continues to stand as one of the most consequential First Amendment decisions in our nation's history. Today, it remains the only Supreme Court case questioning the government's ability to censor the press from releasing sensitive documents. The precedent set by this case has allowed news outlets to report on sensitive issues ranging from Watergate to the Iran-Contra scandal, exposing corruption at the highest levels of government. Daniel Ellsberg's actions have also paved the way for modern-day whistleblowers such as Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning to reveal questionable operations undertaken by the U.S. government. Without Ellsberg's precedent, these men and women would not have been able to lay bare what they viewed as direct threats to our institutions. Even as the current administration continues to attack the credibility and integrity of the press,
News outlets can still report the news without fear of retribution thanks to the precedent set by this case. 